بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم our first integral is integral x from 0 to infinity e to the minus s x ln x sin x over x the real part of s is greater than 0 this integral is the unilateral or one-sided Laplace transform of this function ln x sin x over x if we have integral t from 0 to infinity e to the minus t minus e to the minus x t over t the real part of x is strictly positive we can write down the integrand as the integral w from 1 to x e to the minus w t swapping the order of integration we integrate first with respect to t to get 1 over w the integral with respect to w is ln w using the limits of integration we get ln x minus ln 1 which is ln x another integral that is relevant to our task is this one with parameter eta the real part of eta is greater than zero we have integral x from zero to infinity e to the minus eta x sine x we can write sine x as the imaginary part of e to the i x. The integral of the exponential yields 1 over eta minus i, multiplying numerator and denominator by eta plus i. We get eta plus i over eta squared plus 1. The imaginary part is 1 over eta squared plus 1. Now we consider the integral x from 0 to infinity, e to the minus sx ln x sine x. The integrand here has 1 over x, but we focus only on the product of the logarithm and the sine function. The first step is to employ this first result in reverse. We write ln x as integral t from 0 to infinity, e to the minus t minus e to the minus x t, all divided by t. We swap the order of integration so that we integrate first with respect to x. We can split into two integrals. In the first one, the integrand is e to the minus sx times sine x. In the second, the integrand is e to the minus sx times e to the minus x t. We also have sine x. These two integrals can be evaluated using our second result. The first is 1 over s squared plus 1. The second is 1 over s plus t all squared plus 1. In the numerator of this ratio, we subtract and add 1 over 1 plus t. We split the integral into two integrals. In the first, we keep this part divided by t times s squared plus 1. The remaining terms become the integrand of the second integral. From both integrals, we can take 1 over s squared plus 1 outside. 1 over t times t plus 1 is 1 over t minus 1 over t plus 1. Because there is no s squared plus 1 here, we insert it into the numerator. We can then combine these two terms. In the denominator, we have t times s plus t squared plus 1. Then we have this bracket, s squared plus t squared plus 2st plus 1 minus s squared minus 1. These four terms go away. We can take t as a common factor in the numerator. t and t go away. We are left with minus 1 over 1 plus t plus t plus 2s over 1 plus s plus t squared. Let's go back here. dt over t is d ln t. We do integration by parts. We have the product of ln t and this function of t minus the integral of ln t times the derivative of this function, which is minus e to the minus t plus 1 over 1 plus t all squared. Both limits as t tends to 0 from above and as t tends to infinity or equal to zero after several applications of L'Hopital's rule. This part is zero. The integral t from zero to infinity, ln t e to the minus t, is minus small gamma. Euler mascaron is constant. The integral t from zero to infinity, ln t over one plus t squared, can be obtained using the substitution w equal one over t. When t tends to infinity, w tends to zero. When t tends to zero from above, w tends to infinity. dt is minus dw over w squared. This minus sign can be used to get our integral from zero to infinity. Here is dt without the minus sign. Len t becomes minus len w. One plus t squared is one plus w to the minus one squared. If we multiply, we get one plus w squared. Rewriting w as t, we get the negative of this integral. Double this integral is equal to zero, so this integral is equal to zero. From this part here, we get minus small gamma over s squared plus one. We need to integrate this function, multiply the numerator and denominator by two. We get minus one over one plus t plus one half two t plus four s over s plus t squared plus one. Write this four s as two s plus two s. This integrand can be written as one over one plus t minus half two times t plus s over t plus s squared plus one. We also have minus s over t plus s squared plus 1. When we integrate this part with respect to t, we get minus s, the inverse tangent of t plus s over s squared plus 1. When we use the limits of integration, if t tends to infinity, we get minus s pi over 2 over s squared plus 1. If t tends to 0, we get s, the inverse tangent of s, divided by s squared plus 1. The antiderivative of this part is len 1 plus t minus 1 half len t plus s squared plus 1. When t tends to 0 from above, 
we have ln one from here, which is zero, minus one half ln s squared plus one, when t tends to infinity, this difference tends to zero, because we can write this as one half ln s plus t squared plus one over one plus t all squared, we have t squared upstairs and downstairs, the argument of the logarithm tends to one as t tends to infinity, so this limit is zero. The integral x from zero to infinity, e to the minus sx, where the real part of s is positive, ln x sine x is this function here of s. Our original integral has sine x over x. Here it is, written using the variable u. This is i of u. If we do differentiation under the integral sign, the first derivative of i is integral x from zero to infinity, minus e to the minus u x ln x sine x. This integral was obtained on the first page. Now we have this derivative as a function of u. What is the limit? as u tends to infinity of i of u. If we can justify interchanging the order of limit and integration, the limit goes inside. The limit as u tends to infinity of e to the minus u x is equal to zero. To justify swapping limit and integration, we make use of the dominated convergence theorem. We need first to upper bound the magnitude of the integrand by a function that depends only on x, the dummy variable of integration, and not u, the variable with respect to which we are taking the limit. The magnitude of sine x is less than or equal to the magnitude of x. This ratio here is less than or equal to 1 in magnitude. The magnitude of e to the minus u x, we can write u explicitly as a real part plus i times an imaginary part. The magnitude of e to the minus i x times the imaginary part of u is 1. We are left with e to the minus x, the real part of u. And this is less than or equal to e to the minus x, so long as the real part of u is greater than 1. This is not a problem as we are investigating the case where u tends to infinity. We have an upper bound on the magnitude of the integrand, which is e to the minus x times the absolute value of the natural logarithm of x. If this integral is finite in value, then by the dominated convergence theorem, we can take this limit inside and it then gives us zero. Here is the check that this integral is indeed a finite number. Limit as u tends to infinity of i of u, and this is zero, minus i of s, is the integral from s to infinity of i prime of u. Minus big I of s is the integral u from s to infinity of this function. If we separate this part, we get the integral u from s to infinity of one over one plus u squared. This is multiplied by small gamma. We get gamma times by over two minus gamma times the inverse tangent of s. The antiderivative of this part here is the product ln u squared plus one times one half the inverse tangent of u minus pi over four. We can check via differentiation. The derivative of this part is two u over u squared plus one. Then we have the bracket plus ln u squared plus one. The derivative of this bracket with respect to u is one over two u squared plus one. We use this as a common denominator. Upstairs, we have the natural logarithm of u squared plus one. Then we have two u, the inverse tangent of u minus pi u u is replaced by s to give this term here, but we also need to take the limit as u tends to infinity of this product. Using L'Hopital's rule, we can check that the limit is equal to zero. What we have obtained is minus i of s. We just multiply by minus one to get that i of s, the integral x from zero to infinity, e to the minus sx ln x sine x over x, is the product of these two brackets, the inverse tangent of s minus pi over two, which can be written as minus the inverse cotangent of s. The other bracket has small gamma plus one half ln s squared plus one. The second integral that we have is parameterized by the positive integer n. We have integral t from zero to infinity, the inverse tangent of t divided by t times one plus t to the power n. One over t times one plus t over n is equal to one over t minus summation v from one to n, one over one plus t to the power v. Note that this sum is a geometric series, specifically, it is equal to one over one plus t times one minus one over one plus t raised to the power n, the number of terms in the sum. In the denominator, we have one minus the ratio of the geometric series, which is one over one plus t. This part is equal to one over t minus, if we multiply the numerator and denominator by one plus t, we get t downstairs. Upstairs, we have one minus one over one plus t to the power n, one over t minus one over t. They go away and we end up with one over t times one plus t to the power n. From this summation, I isolate the term corresponding to v equal to one. So I write this as one over t minus one over one plus t minus summation v from two to n, one over one plus t to the power v. This is one over t times one over t plus one. 
And here is the sum now with n minus one terms. We split into two parts. The first part is the integral t from zero to infinity, the inverse tangent of t over t times one plus t, which is the special case when small n is equal to one. We write the integral as an integral from zero to one plus another from one to infinity. Here written using the dummy variable of integration y, I do the change of variables y equal to one over t. So we get an integral from zero to one dt over t squared. We have 10 inverse one over t. Downstairs, we get one over t, one plus one over t. If we multiply this by t squared, we get one plus t for positive t. The inverse tangent of t plus the inverse tangent of the reciprocal of t is equal to pi over two. This can be written as pi over two minus the inverse tangent of t. This integral yields pi log two over two. Then we have integral t from zero to one, the inverse tangent of t. We have one over t minus one over one plus t minus one over one plus t. The integral x from zero to one, the inverse tangent of x over x can be evaluated using the series of the inverse tangent function, which is summation m from zero to infinity minus one to the m x to the two m plus one over two m plus one. We have an x here. So this power is reduced to two m. We can then integrate term by term to obtain summation m from zero to infinity minus one to the power m. In the denominator, we have two m plus one squared. And this is exactly Catalan's constant g. For this integral here, we do first integration by parts. This is integral x from zero to one, the inverse tangent of x d len one plus x. Note that when x is equal to zero, we get zero. And when x is equal to one, we get the natural logarithm of two multiplied by the inverse tangent of one, which is pi over four. We also have minus integral x from zero to one, len one plus x times the derivative of this guy, which is one over one plus x squared. To evaluate this integral, use the substitution x equal to 10t, when x is zero, t is zero. When x is one, t is pi over four. dx is sec squared t dt. The denominator is one plus 10t squared, which is sec t squared. Upstairs, we have the natural logarithm of one plus 10t. We write down this integral as one half the integral itself plus the integral with t replaced by pi over four minus t. The second integral will be t from zero to pi over four, then one plus 10 pi over four minus t. The argument of the logarithm here is one plus 10 by over 4, which is 1 minus 10t, divided by 1 plus 10 by over 4 times 10t. We have 1 plus 10t, 1 plus 10t, plus 1 minus 10t. This quantity is 2 over 1 plus 10t. When we apply the logarithm, we get len 2 minus len 1 plus 10t. We have to integrate from 0 to pi over 4. These two integrals cancel. We end up with pi over 4 times len 2. Let's not forget this one half. Our final result is pi over 4 len 2 minus pi over 8 ln 2, this is pi over 8 ln 2. This integral is Catalan's constant plus pi over 2 ln 2. Then we have this result here multiplied by minus 2. All in all, we get g plus pi ln 2 over 4. The integral of interest is equal to these two terms minus summation v from 2 to n, the integral t from 0 to infinity, the inverse tangent of t, divided by 1 plus t to the power v, replace v by v plus 1. Now our summation is from 1 to n minus 1, this power becomes v plus one. We can do one step of integration by parts. This integral here with the minus sign is equal to one over v integral from zero to infinity inverse tangent of t d one plus t to the minus v. When t is zero, this is zero. When t tends to infinity, this is pi over two. We have t in the denominator, so the limit is also zero. This is equal to minus one over v integral t from zero to infinity one plus t to the power v. When we differentiate, we also get one plus t squared. The challenge now is to evaluate this integral here. Let's call the integrand alpha v, where v is a positive integer. We do partial fractions. Alpha v is written as one over one plus t squared. In the numerator, we have bv minus cv times t plus summation k from one to v. Downstairs, we have one plus t to the power k. The coefficients we have in the numerator are c v plus one minus k, k from one to v. We assume that this is the form when we do partial fractions, the idea now is get the b's and the c's. Note that if we allow v to be equal to zero, then we just have one over one plus t squared. The sum is equal to zero. What we get is b zero minus c zero t over one plus t squared. To have equality for every positive t, b zero is equal to one and c zero is equal to zero. This is the expression for alpha v. Write down the corresponding expression for alpha v plus one. The trick now is to exploit the fact that alpha v plus one is equal to alpha v divided by one plus t. This is alpha v plus one. Here we put this expression after dividing it by one plus t. 
the sum here is written using the summation index j. Let's do the change, j equal to k minus 1. When j is equal to 1, k is equal to 2. When j is v, k is v plus 1. c, v plus 1 minus j becomes c, v plus 1 minus k minus 1, which is c, v plus 2 minus k. This part is equal to that one. We have the exact same summand, but here the summation is k from 1 to v plus 1. There it is from 2 to v plus 1. So from here, we have the extra term corresponding to k equal to 1. This is c, v plus 1 over 1 plus t. This part, copy and paste. And here is this part. Multiply both sides by 1 plus t, 1 plus t squared. We get bv minus cvt. This part is multiplied by 1 plus t. cv plus 1 is multiplied by 1 plus t squared. If we expand the quadratic terms in t cancel, we get bv plus 1 plus cv plus 1 plus t multiplied by bv plus 1 minus cv plus 1. This is true for every positive t. bv is equal to this sum. Minus cv is equal to bv plus 1 minus cv plus 1. If we add the two equations, we get 2bv plus 1 is equal to bv minus cv. If we subtract this equation from that one, we get 2cv plus 1 equal to bv plus cv. Now we have a difference equation or a recursion relating the coefficients bv plus 1, cv plus 1, and bv, cv. The matrix that we have here is multiplied by the scalar 1 over 2. The elements of the matrix are 1, minus 1, 1, and 1. The solution to such difference equation is that bv, cv is equal to this matrix. We have 1 over 2 to the power v, the matrix raised to the power v, times the initial vector b0 is equal to 1, c0 is equal to 0. This means that the 2 by 1 vector BVCV is 1 over 2 to the power V times the first column in the Vth power of this matrix. This matrix is diagonalizable. If we write it as Q, big lambda Q inverse, if the matrix is raised to the power V, we get Q lambda Q inverse, Q lambda Q inverse, Q lambda Q inverse, and so on. We end up with Q on the left, Q inverse on the right, and between them, we have the diagonal matrix with the eigenvalues raised to the power V. What are the eigenvalues of this matrix? The characteristic polynomial is lambda minus 1 squared plus 1. So lambda minus 1 squared is minus 1. Lambda minus 1 is plus or minus i. Lambda is 1 plus or minus i. Suppose that the eigenvector has the form 1 in the first place, eta in the second place. 1 minus eta is equal to 1 plus or minus i times 1. So eta is minus or plus i. The eigenvector associated with the eigenvalue 1 plus i is 1 and minus i. The eigenvector associated with the eigenvalue 1 minus i is 1 and i. 1 plus i is the square root of 2 times e to the i by over 4, and 1 minus i is the square root 2 e to the minus i by over 4. The inverse of the eigenvector matrix, we divide by the determinant, which is i minus minus i. We swap the elements on the main diagonal. We flip the signs of the off-diagonal elements. This one over i can be written as minus i in the numerator. Minus i times i is 1. The second column in Q inverse is i and minus i. When the eigenvalues are raised to the power v, we get the factor 2 to the power v over 2. And then we have one half from here. So we get 2 to the power v over 2 minus 1. The diagonal matrix has the elements e to the plus or minus i by v over 4. When we multiply, we get that the vth power of this matrix is 2 to the v over 2 minus 1. The elements of the matrix involve cosine by v over 4 and sine by v over 4. The coefficients that we need for our partial fractions are the first colon from here. This is alpha v after inserting the coefficients. This sum is written here starting from 2, and this is the term corresponding to small k equal to 1. It is 2 to the minus v over 2, sine by v over 4, all divided by 1 plus t. Now we can integrate over t from 0 to infinity. From here, we get by over 2. The integral from 0 to infinity of 1 plus t to the minus k is 1 plus t to the minus k plus 1, over minus k plus 1. When t tends to infinity, this tends to 0. When t is 0, we get 1 over minus k plus 1. The result of this integral is 1 over k minus 1, written here using the summation index j. These two terms are integrated together. The antiderivative is 1 half len 1 plus t squared minus len 1 plus t. This is 1 half len 1 plus t squared over 1 plus t all squared. As t tends to infinity, the argument of the natural logarithm tends to 1, so this limit is equal to 0. When t is 0, we also have len 1 minus len 1. The survivors are this part and that part. In the summation, do the change of summation index j equal to v plus 1 minus k. When j is equal to v, k is equal to 1. When j is equal to 2, k is equal to v minus 1. We have summation k from 1 to v minus 1. 
this becomes key, G minus one becomes V minus key. This is the result of integrating alpha V, which is one over one plus T to the power V times one plus T squared. Our integral of interest is equal to pi over four ln two plus kata lens constant minus summation V from one to N minus one, one over V, and then this integral here. We can leave the result like this, or we can go one step further. We have a double sum involving sine by k over four. Specifically, we have summation v from one to n minus one, k from one to v minus one, two to the minus k over two, sine by k over four. Downstairs, we have v times v minus k. Swap the order of summation. So we have k from one to n minus two. V is strictly greater than k. So v starts from k plus one, and its highest possible value is n minus one. What are the terms that have v? We have this fraction and that one. When V goes from K plus one to N minus one, the values that we get from here are one over one, one over two, all the way to one over N minus one minus K. When those guys are summed, we get the harmonic number H N minus one minus K. When we sum one over V, we have one over K plus one plus one over K plus two, all the way to one over N minus one. And this is H N minus one minus the harmonic number H K. The double sum involving sine by K over four can be written as a single sum with a summand involving the harmonic numbers. Now rename K as V. Note that our original result has some each V from one to N minus one. Here we have V from one to N minus two. It's not a problem. We can just extend it to N minus one because this bracket is equal to zero when V is equal to N minus one. If V is equal to N minus one, this is H of N minus one plus H of zero, which is zero minus H of N minus one. This is zero. The integral of interest as a function of the positive integer n is by ln two over four plus Catalan's constant. Then we have a sum with n minus one terms, v from one to n minus one, two to the minus v over two over v. We have a big bracket. Cosine by v over four is multiplied by by over two. Sine by v over four is multiplied by hv plus h n minus one minus v minus h n minus one. If n is equal to two, we have these two terms. There is only one term in the sum. Recall that when v is n minus one, this bracket is zero. So what we get is two to the minus one half, that's one over square root two, pi over two, and cosine pi over four is one over square root two. When n is equal to two, we get these two terms minus pi over four. If n is equal to three, we have two terms in the sum. But when p is equal to two, which is n minus one, this bracket is equal to zero. We have cosine pi over two, which is zero. V is equal to one. We have one over square root two, pi over two, cosine pi over four, which is one over square root two, sine pi over four is one over square root two, h of one is one, three minus one minus one, that's one. So it is another h of one, which is one, minus h of two, and h of two is one plus one half, that's a three over two. Simplifying, the integral with n equal to three is by ln two over four plus Catalan's constant minus by over four minus one fourth. When n is equal to four, we have three terms from here. Let's focus first when v is equal to three, this bracket is zero. We have cosine three by over four, that's minus one over square root two. We also have one over two square root two and one third. When V is equal to two, this part is one fourth. Cosine by over two is zero. Sine by over two is one. This bracket is H of two plus H of four minus one minus two. That's H of one minus H of three. This is three over two. This is one minus H of three is minus three over two minus one third. So this is two over three. In a similar fashion, we can get the term in the sum corresponding to V equal to one. Simplifying the results, we get that the integral when one plus t is raised to the power four is by ln two over four plus g minus one half minus five pi over 24.